I'm Andy Kesson, and this is A Bit Lit. Founded at the beginning of the UK lockdown, A Bit Lit is about conversation, celebrating and exploring theatre, literature and creative work across all periods and of all kinds. We've talked to professional wrestlers and about Ghostbusters and medieval sex positivity. We've looked at the histories of race, gender and sexuality. We followed migrating coconuts and the history of wine and cheese. We've gone from Jane Austen and Shakespeare to EastEnders via the history of early television, young adult fiction, photography, animation and documentary making. And with over a hundred films already, many other subjects as well. Join the conversations at our website, abitlit.co, or on YouTube, and follow us on Twitter, at abitlit. Jeff, hello, how are you? I'm great, Andy. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's a delight to have you. Um, I'm really excited to hear from you today, um, to think more about your work on public Shakespeare, and to think what we mean by the idea of uh, doing Shakespeare in public. Um, and I'm particularly excited as well to talk to you as someone who puts their students at the heart of the, of their research and really gets us thinking about how teaching and research can feed off each other. Um, so I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Do you mind introducing yourself, please? Sure. So my name is Jeff Wilson. I am a preceptor of expository writing in the Harvard College Writing Program. So we might have some immediate follow-up questions, Andy, like <laughs> what is a preceptor of expository writing? Uh, so what that means is a few things. First of all, that my university wanted to make sure that I could never just tell someone my job title. It's always a conversation. <laughs> but what a, a preceptor, what it means is that I can see future crimes before they happen. And if I can inform Tom Cruise about them well enough in advance, he can fly <laughs> across town and stop them before they actually do <laughs> happen. Uh, so wh what this means basically is I teach the uh, first year writing course at our university, which like most universities has a required first year writing course. Uh, and I teach the Shakespeare section of our writing course. So it's called Why Shakespeare? And it grapples with uh, Shakespeare's prominence in the modern world. Um, so I'm just kind of in my research, I'm, I'm fascinated by the ethical questions that are asked in Renaissance literature that can still be asked today. And so that means we talk a lot about tragedy. And I'm also interested in tracking how people have responded to those questions over the centuries. And this is where Shakespeare is really helpful because Shakespeare is both so kind of deeply embedded in uh, history and has been continually performed and adapted and reproduced in the centuries uh, since he lived and worked, which uh, allows us to kind of use Shakespeare, use literature to track ideas and how they change over time. Great, thank you. Um, I guess that kind of final point is a really interesting tension we might want to, to start with, which is about whether, whether there's something inherent to Shakespeare which makes him a useful tool to think with, or if it's that long 400 year reception history you've just told us about, which makes him useful to think with. Does that make sense as a, as a distinction? Is it something about his work or is it something about the fact that his work has had this 400 year history of being, of being used, which make them now useful for us? Yeah, I, I really like the notion of Shakespeare as a useful tool. <laughs> it's potentially a bit of an insult to call Shakespeare a tool, but I think we can get away with it. <laughs> Right, so, so I think maybe kind of a little bit like yourself, I, I frame my class as saying this is, uh, we're not here to celebrate Shakespeare, you know, this is not your place to kind of appreciate your favorite writer. Um, we're here to ask this really difficult question about how Shakespeare was chosen as England's literary figurehead. Um, what are the uh, intrinsic qualities of his art and the way that he produced art that come into contact with the extrinsic qualities of culture that are working down upon him to generate, you know, Shakespeare as the the, the one who was the, the chosen one. You know, it, it didn't have to be this way, right? Um, everyone in the 17th century thought it was going to be John Milton, who I'm talking to you on December 9th, John Milton's birthday. Happy birthday, John Milton. Uh, hey. Everyone thought it was going to be Milton, including Milton himself. He said, <laughs> I'm going to be England's national poet. Um, 
but then something happens in the 18th century and then Shakespeare gets loaded with all of this cultural value. And then that um, grows and expands that changes in the 20th century gets globalized, gets digitized in the 21st century. Um, and, and so Shakespeare just come, becomes this really fascinating opportunity for us to think about how ideas move through the world and to think about mm -hmm. how we can come to know a little bit of our history um, by thinking through with against Shakespeare. Yeah, great. Thank you. I apologize. Uh, I think my husband just set fire to our kitchen, but uh, I think the, the flames have been doused now. But I'm sorry for I'm sorry for the alarm. Um, <laughs> yeah, the, uh, if you need to take a, a beat to to check on things, you can. <laughs> I think I think it's all right. I'll, I'll rely on him to douse whatever flames have occurred. Um, yeah, uh, uh, John Mil uh, John Milton, as you say, and also I wonder um, Ben Johnson for a good 150 years looks like a potential. Um, kind of figurehead for Shakespeare's generation as, as well. It's kind of, it's fascinating watching that process happen as Shakespeare come, kind of um, comes out as the kind of uh, primary figure thinking about, uh, thinking about that time period. And Jeff, you very modestly have not mentioned the fact that you have just published a, a new book. Congratulations uh, on that. Looking at Shakespeare and Game of Thrones. So do you mind telling us a little bit about that? Because I think it, in many ways, that's a helpful way to knit together some of the issues you've already raised. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Shakespeare and Game of Thrones grew out of the, the course, the writing course that I teach. And, and in this course, every semester, it's a, a three unit course. In our second uh, unit, we take a Shakespearean text and pair it with a modern adaptation plus a modern social scientific theory. So for example, this past semester, we did Much Ado About Nothing paired with the public theaters, Much Ado About Nothing featuring an all black cast under Stacey Abrams 2020 banner. And then also uh, a social scientist named Jeffrey Hall's book called The Five Flirting Styles which has, has some issues with it, we'll want to acknowledge, um, but it's interesting to, to think about ways that we can use that as a lens to interpret Shakespeare and, and maybe more importantly, use Shakespeare's Much Ado About Nothing as a way to theorize a different approach to the, the uh, theories of flirting. Wow. So uh, that, we, we did Game of Thrones for uh, uh, two semesters, so, so a year. So we took uh, Shakespeare's Henry VI plays and I, I will acknowledge the questionable judgment of assigning all three Henry VI plays to some first year college students, but they, they get so just wrapped up in the history. I mean, those plays just kind of require so much energy to, to understand what's going on. Um, we paired the Henry VI plays with uh, Game of Thrones as a modern adaptation. And it's really fascinating to think about how that does and doesn't work as an adaptation because it's not a direct adaptation yeah. of Shakespeare's plays. Uh, and then we also paired that with uh, the Cigar article in Shakespeare Quarterly about uh, using computer aided uh, statistics to think about authorship in the Henry VI plays. So we had those questions in the air as well. So over the course of these, you know, two semesters teaching Shakespeare and Game of Thrones, I'm just having the most fascinating conversations with students and they're writing the most fascinating essays about mm -hmm. Shakespeare and Game of Thrones and authorship of Henry VI. And it kind of got to the end of that, our, our time working on that. And, and I sort of said, these ideas are too great to, to kind of leave them here within our classroom. And so I put together a, a short book with a bunch of short chapters. And these are really kind of light and breezy chapters. They're, they're, it's the kind of scholarship that I wanted to read when I first got into academia, which is that, you know, I, I don't really come from that world of academia. And so I wanted something that was kind of, it mattered, it connected up with the ethical questions that we're asking. It wasn't too difficult to penetrate kind of reams of scholarship that, that um, I think has its place in the work that we do, um, but also um, can sometimes become a barrier for, so, so it's, it's scholarship written for students. And, and my hope is that, that students are able to think about Shakespeare and, and Game of Thrones and, and um, kind of get entryway to some elevated thought and conversation about these texts. So the, the central question of the book is that uh, it's pretty widely recognized that Game of Thrones, the central narrative in Game of Thrones is based on the Wars of the Roses, this bloody 15th century battle between feuding noble English families. Um, it's not clear at all how Shakespeare, 
who is probably the most famous person for telling that uh, person to tell that story, um, mediated this relationship between the Wars of the Roses and George R. R. Martin's analogy to that in this kind of heightened fantasy world. So that's the, the way that we wanted to think about um, how does Shakespeare have a it's, a, it's a, it's a very deep influence on Game of Thrones, but it's also indirect because there's a little bit of evidence that George R. R. Martin is aware of, you know, Shakespeare's first tetralogy, but it's, it's not extensive by any means. Um, and what seems to be much more likely the case is that um, the sources that really influenced Martin, whether it's historical fiction or um, fantasy literature, were themselves deeply influenced by Shakespeare. And so Shakespeare kind of stands at two steps of a remove from Martin. And so the influence is, is deep, but indirect. And that to me is a fascinating way to think about, you know, the way that Shakespeare shows up elsewhere in the modern world of, of um, sometimes people are trying to be Shakespearean uh, and we don't recognize it. Sometimes people aren't trying to be Shakespearean, but they're influenced by Shakespeare, maybe without knowing it. Sometimes people are trying to hide the way that their work is related to Shakespeare. And, and so um, you, you get a, a chance to see a lot of that at work there with Game of Thrones, um, which has kind of the, the element of corporate interest then uh, that, that make it all, all the more fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. And towards the end of the book, you talk about a very specific kind of corporate interest and a very specific kind of corporation in the guise of the play within the play in the um, the chapter in the book, which George Martin has not yet published, but he has published that chapter. And the TV series has also filmed a very different version of that moment where um, Aya Stark sees um, a, a theatre company putting on the story, the story of her life and the story of, of, of her, of the civil wars that she's lived through. And it's such a self-evidently um, Shakespearean and or early modern theatre company. And there's a, there's a real sense of, of um, uh, depth of knowledge, not about Shakespeare, but about theatrical culture in Shakespeare's time. And, and that seems kind of fascinating because so many of the stories you're telling about where Shakespeare sits, not just in Game of Thrones, but in TV culture more generally now, that he's there in the narrative decisions and the characterization of characters on this on the page, but also in the casting decisions about um, previous acting experience of, of particular performers and the placing of actors with Shakespearean, not just Shakespearean experience, but perhaps kind of aura of Shakespearean modes of performance in particular roles, whether that be Star Trek um, or indeed Game of Thrones. So it feels like there's all kinds of things going on at the level of, of kind of corporate identity, whether that's a, a theatre company and a play within a play, all the way up to HBO, I suppose. Yeah, and, and that's, for me, one of the fascinating things to think about in light of the 21st century, where so many of our kind of major motion picture and television events are fantasy and, and sci-fi, in contrast to the 1990s when it wasn't that way, right? Mm -hmm. But now that we've got these sort of heightened supernatural worlds that are so common, you know, that mixture of the kind of the very supernatural, but also the very human, that's pretty Shakespearean. And, and to me, it was fascinating to think about um, what does being trained as a Shakespearean actor prepare you to do to enter into some of these worlds? And so I was able to, to interview some of the Game of Thrones actors, uh, Conleth Hill and Anton Lesser and, and Julian Glover. And uh, I'm happy to report Julian Glover is very well caffeinated. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but but so um, several of them made the point to me that that kind of acting Shakespearean tragedy and, and being able to believably convey these stories about these medieval worlds, these ancient Roman worlds that none of us have ever lived in, and to do it with humanity um, and plausibility, you know that that prepares you for these supernatural science fiction fantasy genres that are so prominent right now. Yeah. Yeah, that's really fascinating. Um, Jeff, it's, if it's all right then to shift to um, some of the other questions that you raised at the start of the, the film, um, and we can either stay with Game of Thrones or you might want to talk about other aspects of your work, but you, you raised the issue of the, the ethical questions that Shakespeare either raises or enables us to tackle now. Um, do you mind telling us a bit more about some of those ethical questions? Yeah, so th these are questions like, you know, what brings one person to cause catastrophic harm to another? Mm. And 
for me, the, the, one of the core questions is who's to blame, the individual or the culture? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, one of Shakespeare's uh, favorite questions to ask in, in tragedy is, is how, how do you respond to unimaginable pain and suffering? And so we're able to kind of think through some of these. Um, for, for me, this is manifested in a few different projects. One is a project on Richard III, which looks at the way that Richard's body has traveled through time from Bosworth Field into Shakespeare's hands, out of Shakespeare's hands, and then into the, the modern world. There's, there's this, my, my uh, favorite moment from this uh, research is there's a, a painting, or not, a, uh, there's a picture of Salvador Dali uh, painting, doing his painting of Laurence Olivier in character as Richard III. And so, so I mean, just think about the layers of interpretation here, right? So we're interpreting this photograph of a visual artist who's interpreting a performer, who's interpreting a playwright, who's interpreting a historical figure. And that, that to me is just the, the, the best kind of symbol of what it's like to interpret Richard III, because there's so many layers of interpretation that exist between us and the thing that we're trying to interpret. Um, that, that it's, it's hard to kind of find some ground. And so we always have to sort of supply our own grounds from our, our kind of deep core, ethical, theological, philosophical, social beliefs. Um, and that's why I think we see so much both within Shakespeare's plays that involve Richard and in the, the history of their afterlives, that the meaning of his body changes so much that it gets interpreted from different perspectives and it gets argued about and it gets, you know, uh, connected up to different contexts of interpretation in really fascinating uh, ways. So those are some of the, the, the ethical questions I like to ask with, with Richard III. I've also grown out of my, my writing course. Um, I'm, I'm, I've worked on a series of essays about Hamlet. So, so when I got to uh, my university, the administration asked me if I would teach Hamlet every semester. And I said, absolutely not, because, you know, you need seven weeks to do Hamlet and we're going to be talking about writing. We're not going to be talking about Shakespeare. And, and so um, I said, uh, I don't know, but the, they kind of convinced me. And so I, I basically my, my response was I teach in our class almost nothing about the content of Hamlet. I just sort of remain silent about it. And we talk about how to build uh, quality essays. And lo and behold, every semester, I get 25 of the most amazing student essays about Hamlet that are deeply personal to them. I've never read the same Hamlet essay twice. And it's just crushing to me to discover that Hamlet doesn't need Jeff Wilson to work. Uh, and so, so growing out of this, the, the deal I made with myself was that every semester when I taught Hamlet, I would myself write a new essay about Hamlet as a way to kind of approximate what some of my students were going through to, to know, okay, here's where they are in the thinking process. And so I, I've been able to, to publish a number of those and, and we're looking at all sorts of things there. Like, you know, how do we look at American fraternity culture uh, as a lens to interpret what's going on with all the drinking that we see happening in Shakespeare's Denmark. Um, we're looking at one of the most frequent words in Hamlet isn't, you know, ghost or revenge or tragedy, but it's love. And what would it mean to think of Hamlet as a tragedy of love, as, as Hamlet's actions are motivated, not by hatred, but by love? Um, and so, so uh, I, I love to kind of think about, you know, uh, how, how some of these questions that are asked in the play, which we, we still very much don't understand what's happening in Hamlet, you know. Um, and it seems like what, what scholars we often do is we supply context as a way to reassure us. Um, but if we just sort of look at Hamlet in and of itself and, and we ask, what, what is going, why would someone think this is a good idea to write this play? Um, we, we still have a lot to, to figure out about that text. Um, why would someone think it's a good idea to write this play is a very good question. I love, <laughs> I love that. And I'm intrigued by the idea of using Hamlet in the classroom in order to be silent about Hamlet. And I guess I, I, I'm a nosy man. So I'd like to know, what do you talk about whilst not talking about Hamlet in your seven weeks of class? <laughs> I mean, I mean we, we talk about life, you know, we, we talk about, um, so I, uh, when I was in my younger days, I once attempted suicide and that gives me a certain perspective on, on the reading of Hamlet when I sit down to do it. And, and I look at that moment in act three, scene one, where, you know, Ophelia 
is on stage. We often forget she's on stage for to be or not to be. And she overhears Hamlet talking about his suicidal thoughts. And then later in the play, she herself becomes suicidal. And, you know, um, the way that suicide contagion works in the play, we mm -hmm. can analyze and, and that's a fascinating discussion to have. And then um, we can also think about the ways that uh, we need to be very careful when we teach a text like Hamlet, that we need to be alert to potential uh, mental health struggles that our students could be going through and that we can use a text like Hamlet to kind of raise some awareness about those things. Yeah. Um, Jeff, thank you for sharing that. I'm, I'm really sorry to hear this. Um, but I think you're raising, I mean, you're raising so many important points there, but it is, it is very, you know, your first question in this film was why Shakespeare? And as someone who can sometimes be a bit more, why not Shakespeare? Um, Shakespeare does, there is a risk of peddling a kind of valorization of suicidal characters, it seems to me, when we present Shakespeare to teenage readers, whether it be Romeo and Juliet or, or Hamlet, and we strongly valorize these figures. Um, there, is, there are all kinds of problems with, with that. I think pushing that on anybody, let alone a, a teenager who themselves will be struggling with, you raised the issue of, of love earlier, um, identity issues. And many of these plays are explorations of and potentially valorizations of, of suicidal feelings. And there, there's all kinds of, of pedagogical and ethical issues that that, that raises, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and so for me, kind of, you know, I very much have used literature in my life as a way to kind of work through some things. And I, I think I try to um, encourage students and their, their essays that they write, encourage other scholars to kind of remember the reason we got into this in the first place. It came from kind of love of literature. It came from kind of wanting to work out some big questions that we all had. Mm -hmm. Sometimes along the way in our professionalization, we get a little bit wrapped up with this kind of uh, internal scholarly, you know, apparatus, and, and we get a little bit consumed by that. And, and so I, I always, am, I'm fascinated by the, the scholars who are able to kind of maintain those big energetic ethical questions where we're, you know, the, 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 the literary readings we're doing matter and, and they can kind of uh, give us understanding about, about life. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they can, you know, help us think about uh, the, some of the, the questions that we have at the same time, they can help us get some distraction from the questions that we have. I mean, right now we're all just a little bit desperate for some joy and delight in our lives. And, you know, I think scholars, we can also do a little bit better job of, of um, you know, creating moments of, of happiness and, and, and uh, a little bit of escapism. Yeah. Here's to that. Um, uh, when I, when I launched my first book, um, the head of education at the Globe, Patrick Spottiswood, said to me he was very impressed that I used the F word in in, in that book. Um, and uh, I, I perhaps won't say the word that I thought he was saying, but it began with the word mother and then continued with the letter F. Um, and uh, so I was I was shocked that he was excited that I'd used that word. And he said, no, 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 the F word is fun. <laughs> you use the word fun at the start of your book. I don't think I don't think he got as far as the page with uh, the other word on it. Um, but uh, yeah, there is there is something I think really joyful about you know being determined to relocate joy in academic discourse because it, it very often, it very often isn't isn't there. Um, but that I, I mean, maybe... look, well, you know we're scholars, right? We we critique power. That's what we do. Thank goodness, mm -hmm. because uh, otherwise the people might not do it. Um, but we also want to be mindful of the ways. And here, I think uh, scholars have a lot to learn from the theater world, the ways that you can create an atmosphere for a transformative uh, experience for a reader by using comedy and tragedy together. Well, so that, thank you. That's a really good bridge to what I was going to ask you next, because it makes me want to ask, what is a joyful way to think about tragedy? You know, <laughs> for me, it's, it's all about... Uh, the response to pain and suffering, right? So, so we've got these, uh, this is being very reductive here, but so two traditions of tragedy, one growing from the Greeks, one from the Romans. Seems to me the Greeks were all about, here are the things that you can do that will lead to great pain and suffering. And the Romans were all about pain and suffering is gonna happen. 
here's some ways in which people respond to it. Mm -hmm. And with Senecan tragedies, so often the argument is that it's our response to the unfortunate things that happen in life that um, kind of snowball into even greater pain and suffering. And so I, I think, um, you know, tragedy helps us imagine uh, the undesirable and how we're going to respond when that happens. So we're, I'm speaking with you in you know, December, 2020, we've just had this presidential election in the United States. And a lot of people were a little bit anxious about how this was gonna go. And, um, you know, for, for the, the weeks leading up to uh, the, the election in my class, we didn't really talk about it all too much other than to say, um, what for you would be the worst that could happen? And what will you do if that ends up happening? Because to, 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 Shakespeare was absolutely fearless in thinking about the worst that could happen. And working with Shakespearean tragedy helps us kind of activate our imagination to say, what would I do in that situation? Or how might I respond in that situation? And to me, that's an extremely valuable, a useful tool, right? Um, that has real kind of human consequences as we start to think about the unimaginably bad things that could happen in life that um, have become very imaginable in 2020. <laughs> yeah, or just here. <laughs> um, yeah, I, um, I do. I do wonder if it, there. It does feel like 2020 has started to redeem itself in various ways towards the end of the year. But uh, um, yes, I am mindful that we have. 2021 to come we don't quite know what's around the corner in um in any of the countries either the countries in which we're speaking or anyone might be watching from um yeah thank you jeff this has all been really exciting I, i'm mindful of the fact that we haven't really talked about the long reception history that you raised um at the start of the film and how that might um inflect some of the conversations that we're having but i guess the nearest we got there is um, is Richard III. And I love your example of us looking at Salvador Dali, looking at Olivier, thinking about Shakespeare, thinking about Richard III. And I guess in each of those interpretive moments, each one of us is asking that question that you raised of what causes catastrophic harm and how can we respond to it? And that feels like the most urgent question any of us could be asking in the year of our Lord 2020. <laughs> Yeah, and, and um, so you, you've also got, you know, an example of, of something like um, like Macbeth, right, where uh, Shakespeare is asking this question about when, when bad things happen, uh, who's to blame, the individual or the society, because so much of what happens in Macbeth is this com complex web of his personal psychological struggle coming into contact with this aristocratic uh, kind of culture of upward mobility that has created his his mental state and, and this desire to, to advance in the world that he has. Um, so it's, it's, I mean, Macbeth kind of at the level of the aristocracy is so weirdly modern that, it, you know, this, this medieval Scottish uh, royalty should, should have no kind of footing whatsoever in the modern world. But it, at the level of the aristocracy, it's an open class system that, that is sort of, you know, everyone from the various kings at the start of the play is fighting for a little bit of power and wants a little bit more. And then, you know, you, you see what happens when, when Macbeth kind of uh, uh, comes into contact with that. And I think for me, uh, Macbeth is a really good example of, uh, I, I suppose that I would say that Shakespeare cares more about culture than he does about character. Hmm. And that, you know, character criticism is, is such a prominent force in the history of Shakespeare studies. But if you look at the plays, it's always the situation that the character is embedded in. It's the society that the character is embedded in that creates that personality in the first place hmm. and to me especially in the tragedies that's what Shakespeare continually comes back to that if we as a society end up with certain cultural formations tragedy is going to happen because it's going to generate personalities those personalities are going to come into power and I mean this is the argument of all Shakespearean tragedy right is that you know when the when power is centralized at the top the state hangs on the fragile emotions of privileged men and the routine 
moral failings that they have, like revenge and ambition and deceit, these kind of whip out into social catastrophe and, and pain, suffering, death, downfall of dynasties. You know, so, so for, for Shakespeare, um, character matters, but character comes from culture. You're making me wonder if that means that we should be pronouncing in the title Merchant of Venice with an emphasis on Venice and not Merchant. And also that the comedies in some ways maybe articulate that more clearly in a kind of this world of, you know, much ado about nothing an emphasis on um, a whole society of people making a do rather than on individuals or, or love's labor's lost or what have you. This kind of plurality of, of people maybe is witnessed by the comedy titles more than those kind of individual protagonists named in the titles of tragedies. Absolutely. And with much ado about nothing, you know, the whole play depends on the wartime frame mm -hmm. that, that we're in a kind of post-war situation. We're transitioning into peacetime that allows for um, romance, that allows for friendship, that allows for comedy to happen. And then this is why the, the public theater version was so absolutely compelling. I mean, one of the number of reasons, um, but because it, it sort of updates us to America 2020, where we've got these Black Lives Matter soldiers who have been fighting not a physical war, but a cultural war now. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have a little bit of a reprieve and they're able to go back home and they're able to experience the joys of love and, and, and romance and the comedy that ensues from there. Um, but then that, and, and that production is, um, adapted and, and played with in some really fascinating and some some really uh kind of disturbing ways too i don't want to spoil it <laughs> <laughs> well um yeah we uh, is is there footage available to see online can we push people towards footage yeah you know uh it, it was released by pbs um it, access to it kind of comes and goes and in, in right. two or three month wave so uh, who, who okay. knows yeah. Um, Jeff, thank you very much. Moving towards the, the conclusion now, I've really valued your emphasis on the importance of ethical questions. I love the idea of asking in what way Shakespeare is useful. I really love the idea of Hamlet as a love play, and I'm going to be thinking about that for quite some time to come. You advocated the importance of scholarship as a form of critiquing power, and you've asked us how we might respond to catastrophic harm and um, this film will be going out in early 2021 and I feel like there's a New Year's resolution for all of our listeners there in that question. Um, we end our films by asking where the word literature sits in your vocabulary, what the word means to you. So do you mind telling us a bit about that? Sure, Andy. So so I, I knew you were going to ask this question. And so so what I did was I went back to this time in, in my life when I was very, very fascinated by kind of first principles and, and you know, defining terms and so forth. So <laughs> in my definition of the word literature, circa 2009, according to Jeff Wilson, literature is written or spoken imitation that demonstrates by the repetition and the transgression of formal conventions an acquaintance with a given tradition of writing or speaking. Mm -hmm. Now that is, is a mouthful. Um, but for me, what it comes down to is literature is a way into history. That, mm -hmm. that literature is literature because it's aware of the history of the traditions in which it's working. And that's why for, for me, the, the, the great opportunity of, of literature, literary studies is being able to track stories over time, being able to see how two people respond to the same moment in Shakespeare when they're 400 years apart, or being able to enter into a conversation with someone from the 18th century because they respond to Hamlet in a different way that I respond to Hamlet. And because we're sort of have this kind of common ground of, of the literary text, we're, we're able to enter into this conversation that kind of time and space doesn't allow, but that, that kind of literary studies does allow us to have these, these conversations that span the centuries that, that there, and, and it's always the kind of the big questions that we keep coming back to, you know, about what's most important in life. How should I live? Um, what am I fighting for? That, that literature gives us a way to um, see what other people have thought about those questions. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, uh, I think for lots of people, but certainly for me, thinking of literature as a form of imitation and a, a demonstration of acquaintance with generic or stylistic traditions, that's really fascinating. And I guess what's so kind of odd about that is that it's somehow got to be a very in, inexact copy in order for it to be literature. It's got to be a copy which changes 
rather than a copy which is a simulacrum and an exact replication of whatever it is it might be imitating or showing acquaintance with. Um, so yeah, I'm fascinated by that. Thank you very much. Jeff, it's been a really fascinating conversation. Uh, really appreciate your time. I love seeing you not quite astride the world, but in front of the world and protecting all of us with your presence there. So thank you very much. Andy, I really appreciate this. This has been a great <laughs> chat. Take care. All right, we'll see you.